Stupid. A rap. Spick. Dyke. Faggot. Slant eye. Cracker. Nigga. Bitch. Lard ass. Ho. Bastard. Dork. When words hurt. When words hurt. They say sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. I mean, they're just words, right? But words like the ones we just heard are intended to hurt. They're fighting words, what we call hate speech. And they can make being a teenager even tougher than it already is. It's hard enough trying to figure out who you are and where you fit in without someone calling you names or bullying you. And on a typical day, experts say as many as 160,000 kids stay out of school because they're afraid of just that. We've all seen hate speech in action. It's calling people names because they have a different skin color than you or a different sexual orientation. Maybe even just because of how they look. How do you define hate speech? There are several varieties of hate speech. This could come out in things that are said to each other, things that are written on someone's locker. And these things that are written or said or implied have to do with race, religion, ethnic background, um, income, body type, sexual orientation. There's a whole list of things here that would qualify as hateful speech. Right, hate speech isn't just using bad language or saying something offensive to someone else. It's language said from one person to another that's meant to harm the person who hears it. So that it has that um, level of prejudice or discrimination kind of built into it. Um, I, I'd say hate speech is like something you use to probably like hurt a person, either like emotionally or to make them feel lower. I think a lot of that hate stems from either ignorance or or trying to be superior, and you know, I don't think it's right. Hate speech for me is connected to a continuum around violence that begins first with just what is your intent as you're about to speak, and then the level of the way in which you speak in terms of escalating conflict, which can be violence. Now that we know what hate speech is, what does it feel like when you're the target? How would you feel if someone made fun not just of you, but of your family or of where you came from? After the September 11th terrorist attacks, some people thought it was okay to lash out at Muslims and people of South Asian descent. Abhijit, a Sikh teenager, knows it's never okay. Um, being a Sikh in high school was kind of different. I was like one of three guys, you know, who looked different from everyone else. And um, I remember I was a towelhead when I first moved to this house 12 years ago. And a towelhead, they called me shithead, they called me other stuff. So I was a new kid on the block. And um, I got beat up and my dad said, you, gotta, you better go outside and, you know, fight or else you're not coming back to the house. When someone calls someone a name like towelhead or shithead or any other kind of name or derogatory term, it's, they think that they're on top of the world. They think that, you know, they're higher than that person that they're calling names on. It's like getting a high at the time. Like, you know, yeah, like they're the man, or, you know, they're the woman or whatever. And that's what the whole thing about name calling is because they have no other way to, you know, satisfy themselves that this is the only way to bring other people down. That's the only way they bring themselves up. It does feel bad at the time, but then you can't really feel sorry for yourself because if you feel sorry for yourself, then it's like, you know, people are going to bother you even more. So you have to stand up and you have to do what's right. Well, in this world today, like, we have a lot of, you know, stereotypes going on, and um, the problem is that, like, people as the Sikhs who look different than, like, the, the general American public is, we're put into the same group as, like, terrorists, you know, around the world. Right after September 11th, I went to ISA, it's like a big gym, and I was the only Asian person there, not even Indian, I was the only Asian person there, and they were like, some girl said, yeah, you look like Osama Bin Laden. Well, yeah, on TV, you see, like, Osama Bin Laden, he wears a white turban, and I wear a white turban. It is a turban, but it's totally different. I mean, like, you know, turbans have been worn throughout history for, like, people in Egypt, people in India, all over, th all over the world, people have been wearing turbans. You know, one person with a turban blows up two buildings in, in, in Manhattan, and um, he's the worst guy. So that doesn't mean everyone who wears a turban is bad. When I get associated with people, you know, bad people in society, like terrorists, I mean, once they see me, yeah, they might say something, but once they start talking to me and they see my views, they're like, you know, I'm, you know, I've been living here for so long and I know what's going on and, you know, I'm not a nut myself. 
I mean, then it, it makes a difference because like it takes like two minutes, like the first two things or three words that you say in the opening sentence when you meet someone, I mean, that makes the difference. I mean, if I start talking about like, yeah, America sucks, this and that, I burn flags, blah, blah, blah. I mean, then, you, then, then they won't like me. But like, if I'm just a normal person, I listen to, you know, Jay-Z on the radio and watch basketball on TV and, you know, do my homework every night. I mean, I'm a normal kid, really. I mean, there's, there's nothing different about me. I mean, don't assume that some guy's named Muhammad, he's part of a terrorist network. I mean, if some guy, you know, where the interpreter and looks different, don't assume that he's a bad person. I mean, the main thing is getting to know people around you. At first, Abuji fought back with his fists. Later on, he used words to reach out to people to show them who he was, that he wasn't so different after all. But other teens react by hiding who they are. Jesse, a young lesbian, did just that. I definitely think that words have the power to change people's identities. Maybe not change, but um, stall their identities until um, you know, they feel comfortable enough to accept who they are. But I know that when I was in high school and I heard someone being called faggot, I would, um, you know, I would stand up for that person, but at the same time, I'd say I would hate to be you right now. I'd hate to be in your shoes because that just sucks. <laughs> I, I think that because of that, I, my identity was kind of put on hold until I was out of that environment and in an environment where there were people who were more supportive and less uh, insulting. I think in a way, I kind of always knew that I was gay. Um, and I talk to all my friends from high school and they all say that they've always known, like ever since I was in sixth grade. So I guess that's that just says it right there. I know a lot of people who came out in high school um, to themselves. They never came out to anyone else because they knew that they would get taunted and teased because our high school wasn't very liberal. Um, even though people will say, oh, I'm really liberal, they still made a lot of judgments and stereotypes about people. And it was, very, it was a very uncomfortable environment to be anything other than the norm. Whatever happened to your dreams and aspirations? Over the years, uh, I've been called fat. I've been called um, dyke, lezzy. Uh, I've been called faggot a couple times. I still don't, I haven't really forgiven people for that. I guess I hold a grudge, but it's, it's made a large impact on my life. What the feeling is like, it kind of feels I feel very scared, actually. I feel very frightened. Um, I don't really stay out all that late anymore because of everything that's been going on. There have been a lot of hate crimes, and I, I do tend to walk faster after I've been called something like a fag. I'm, I'm very conscious of being assaulted, and it's not really, not only because of my sexuality, but it's just because of the way I look, because a lot of people don't like the way I look at all and so they will pick on you for that. If I was to say one thing to the people who call me dyke or fag or whatever, uh, I would tell them to be in my shoes for a day. I would tell them to walk around the city um, with my short hair and like my chain and the way I look and go around and you know see how many times they get insulted and then see how it feels and then they can think about maybe calling me a dyke or a fag. But until they know how it is to be in my shoes, they don't really have a right to call me anything, especially if they don't know me. You know, get to know a person first before you, before you insult them. Could I be so good? Should I be? Should I be? Fear of being labeled as gay kept Jessie from confronting her own sexuality. So she hid who she was from everybody, even herself. Abhijit didn't have that choice. People singled him out because of his cultural background and used his turban, the symbol of his religious identity, as an excuse to call him names. Sometimes hate speech is even simpler and more personal. Tara came under fire simply because of how she looked. 
The last time somebody said something hurtful to me, the one I really remember is when I was like younger, like nine or 10, and I was in a, a theater company. And when I was there, I really didn't feel like I belonged. We did singing there and, you know, drama there. And like a lot of the girls were older than I, myself. So of course I felt out of place. It used to be times we used to try for parts, like, who wants to be this part? And it was like, I'd be scared to raise my hand because I was afraid of people would say. And then one day I really rose my hand to sing a song. And like all I heard in the back was, I don't know why you picked her to do it because she don't know what she's doing anyway. She can't sing, she's fat and she's ugly. So when that hit me, it was like, wow, so I'm, I, can't, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm fat and I'm ugly. That really like hit home because when I was younger, like I used to always see all the little kids running around, you know, summertime with their little cute tops on and stuff like that. And when I was younger, I really concentrated on how people looked and how people looked at me. I think that when people say things about you, it tends to get you to look at yourself in not in ways of looks, but in like the way you are. Like you may try to change yourself a little bit. Like with myself, I think I've tend to like to not be as outspoken as I am. Like to tend to stay to myself a little bit more. Like when people say things about, like when people like when I'm around a group of people, like at certain times before this anything would have happened, I would have just jumped in a conversation. Now it's like, woo, stand back, you know. So that's kind of how it is. I went through a time like a couple of months ago when I was really depressed. Like I would cry for no reason and thing like that because when people talk about you, it's like. When they talk about you, it kind of sticks in your head. And when it sticks in your head, you walk around with it all the time. So it's like you may walk down the street and be like, you may hear it echo in your head, or you may hear it and you may like, like look around and be more cautious of your surroundings and things like that. And like when people say things about you, like you, you tend to live your life like it's the truth. Like when they tell you enough, you start, start to feel like it's really true. And like I've gotten like really depressed. Like I'd come in my room and I'd be mean to people because I didn't know how to be nice because I felt nice didn't exist anymore because people were being so mean to me. So it, it's really depressing. It's really depressing sometimes. Sometimes you just, there are many times when I feel like I don't even want to leave the room or I don't even want to live anymore. And it's, 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 it gets really bad sometimes. People will say like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's only words like sticks and stones and stuff like that. Like that is so like, I hate people say that because it really hurts bad because when you walk around, and it's like when people say things to you and you walk around, you really think about it all the time. Like, there's plenty of times when I've just heard it in my head all the time, all the time. Like, you can't do this, or you're ugly, and you're this, and you're that. Like, it, it gets in your head, like it occupies a lot of space, and it like echoes, Augusta. And it's like, it, it gets to the point where it's like, you know, it does hurt me, because I, I, I go around with it, and I travel around with it, and it... It, it's inside of me and I hear it all the time and for you to say like sticks and stones and that doesn't work It's only just words words mean a lot. They really do Maybe the people who called Tara names thought they were just teasing her But those words hurt so much that Tara became depressed even suicidal She fought back against hate speech by finding her own voice That's just one way to take words that hurt and turn them into something positive positive. Me to do is. At the time that I was really going through like a little, a real depressing state, like I would like try to sit by myself and like write things down, like not necessarily poems or like songs or anything like that, but just like write things down, like how I felt and stuff like that. And like I also went to um, be around friends a little bit more, true friends a little bit more, doing things I like, like singing and stuff, like going to city kids and stuff like that was really. It's really like how I like vented myself, like got away from all the bleh, just came into fresh air. City Kids is a program that I started about three years ago. And when I first got there, I was like really shy. Like, cause you know, that was a time in my life where I was really going through a lot of things. So when I came to City Kids, it was like, it was like, I felt like I belonged. Like it's so like cliche. Like when you, when I walked in, I was like, oh, it's so. So like it's like really I really love it there. It's like um it's a repertory program. That's a City Kids is really broader than a repertory program, but the part that I'm really involved in is a repertory program, which is like the singing, the acting, the dancing aspect of City Kids, where we go into like when we do um, performances, and we sometimes we may go out to schools or hospitals stuff like that. Really like um 
do things like to inspire teens or people, our peers, to show them that they're not alone in the world. And that's really something that I needed right then, to know I wasn't alone at all. And I really felt that I belonged there. Somebody who says something about me, if I actually got to confront them, I don't think there's enough words that I can say. Like, there are so many feelings that get bottled up inside of you that when you actually get to see that person, it's like they all seem to pour out, but not in the right order that you would like them to pour out. When a teenager is a victim, it's hard to express, you know, they're upset, but I think they should phrase it in, in terms of themselves. I feel bad when you say that. Do you know how it makes me feel when you say that? Rather than saying, you shouldn't say that, or attacking the other person, it should be phrased in terms of its impact on the target. When I, when I see my friends being called names, I absolutely stand up for them. I say, that's not right. I don't think that that's acceptable behavior. You know, you should know better. Like, especially if it's a people, group of people that I know, and they're making like, you know, a homophobic a joke or something like that. I'll say that's not funny. I don't think that's funny and I'll explain why. One of the things the bystander should do to think about whether he or she is going to be an ally, really kind of assist in that situation, is first kind of discern whether or not it's a situation that if they spoke up they would be safe. That there isn't a weapon around or something that would clearly escalate anything if they did stand up. And then if they did discern that that was possible, is to simply say what we call an I message in the field of conflict resolution. You know, I feel very upset when I hear you speak to John in that way because it demeans him and it demeans all of us by hearing that. And I would like you to not do that. Simple. People should take the time out and you know, learn about other religions, other societies, you know, how other people live, what's wrong, what's right. And they shouldn't come up with their own assumptions about other people because that's, that's the main problem with all the hate. We think that we know a lot, we really don't know much. The more we could have lives that put us in direct contact with a variety of cultures and a variety of richness of differences in our lives, the more we will be able to accept people for who and what we are. We could read books from people of all different backgrounds. We could listen to music from people of all different backgrounds. But ultimately, we know from the research that unless we have in our lives a very multicultural, rich life experience where on a day-to-day -day basis, we're coming in touch with people who are different from ourselves, then it's pretty hard to begin to break down the stereotypes we have about each other, clearly. Another way that you could promote diversity and prevent hate speech is by joining organizations like SHINE, for instance. SHINE is basically a place where a bunch of different people can come together and promote diversity. And they can do things like paint murals of faces that show all different cultures and all different kinds of people. Or you can go to their site where you can write poetry and have other people comment on it, or where you can have a journal, you can get advice, there's horoscopes, and, oh, and they have benefit shows, and they raise money for good causes, and it's a good place to go if you need to, like, feel included, I guess. Hateful language comes from ignorance. It comes from anger. It comes from something as basic as fearing people who seem different. Those words cause pain, and they often lead to violence. But it doesn't have to be that way. Next time you see it happen, think about what you can do. Like Abhijit, take time to get to know people. The more you find out about other cultures or groups, the more you'll realize they're not so different from you. Remember, whether hate speech is directed at you or someone else, you don't have to take it. Take a cue from Tara, speak up for yourself and for others. 
But stay calm. Don't let someone's angry words provoke a fight or even hate speech of your own. The argument against hate speech is pretty simple, really. How would you feel if someone said something like that to you? Like Jesse said, take a walk in someone else's shoes. And if you've ever called someone terrorist, dyke, ugly, or even thought of calling someone thick, faggot, cracker, remember that words really do hurt. Could I be so good? Should have been, should have been. How did it turn so bad? Who to blame? You again.